Hello, everyone. Welcome to our reflection for the second Sunday of Lent. I invite you now to listen to a proclamation of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, his face changed in appearance and his clothes became dazzling white. And behold, two men were conversing with him, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and spoke about his exodus, which he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions had become overcome with sleep, but becoming fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as they were about to depart, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But he did not know what he was saying. And while he was still speaking, a cloud came and cast a shadow over them, and they became frightened as they entered the cloud. And from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my chosen son. Listen to him. And after the voice had spoken, they found Jesus alone. They fell silent and did not at this time tell anyone about what they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. This story, which is commonly called the Transfiguration, is a very familiar one. But I would like to consider what this story has to say to us about a very familiar question. And that is, what happens when we pray? What happens when we pray? I think that, you know, when Jesus went up on the mountain, he encountered the Holy One, but he didn't go up on the mountain just so that uh, the disciples could watch him or be his companions. He took them up the mountain so that together they could all pray. This story, which is itself a uh, reflection of the memory of the early Christian community, passed on from generation to generation is itself the fruit of prayer. So I would like to suggest that we look at this story as a way of helping us to answer the question, how do we pray, or what happens when we pray, excuse me, by asking what happened to Jesus when he prayed and what happened to the disciples when they prayed. So let's consider first what happened to Jesus when he prayed. Jesus went up on the mountain the place that in the Old Testament scriptures is the place where people encounter God, and Jesus encountered the Holy One on that mountain. And he was changed in appearance in a way that was reminiscent of what happened to Moses when Moses went up on this mountain. You call that Moses came back from that mountain, and he was changed in appearance. He was white. Um, and then, excuse me, uh, there is the appearance of Moses and Elijah with Jesus on the mountain while he's praying. And um, it's significant that Moses and Elijah talk to Jesus about his exodus, which he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem. It's significant that they talk about his exodus because both Moses and Elijah were Old Testament figures who themselves were associated with an exodus. Moses was associated with the exodus of the chosen people from the slavery of Egypt through the Red Sea in the desert for 40 years and eventually into the promised land of Canaan, although Moses himself doesn't get there. Elijah, on the other hand, is a significant prophet of the Old Testament whom we are told is taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot in a whirlwind. That Moses and Elijah are talking about his exodus, which he's going to accomplish in Jerusalem, means that they're helping Jesus to come to understand his cross and death, his exodus from the tomb, his resurrection, and his ascension, his exodus from this earth, in terms of the very notion of exodus or very notion of departure. So what's going on here in this story 
is that Jesus is coming to grips with something that is central to his mission and identity as he is praying. We might say that he interprets his mission and identity in terms of Exodus, and now what he's doing is receiving, claiming, and making his own that which he is given in this identity. It is not too much to say that literally he is coming to see himself in a new light and that the disciples also, although they don't understand it fully at the time, come to see Jesus in a new light. So there's lots going on in Jesus' prayer experience, what happens when Jesus prays. But what about when the disciples pray? What happens? I think it's not a little bit humorous and a little bit consoling that we are told that the disciples fell asleep. <laughs> they fell asleep. And yet, uh, we are also told that they were afraid. They became fearful. We are told that uh, they hear a voice from the cloud. And the cloud, the voice in the cloud says, this is my chosen son. Listen to him. In essence, what's happening is they're catching a glimpse, which they do not yet understand, uh, of the reality that the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus is an exodus which surpasses all others. And they are also, uh, over the years that follow, are going to remember that just eight days earlier, Jesus had said to them, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow in my footsteps. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What's happening here is that the disciples themselves are coming to understand, first of all, uh, the Jesus that they had been walking with and listening to. They understand now that they see him in a new light. They see themselves in a new light as people who are called to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And in so doing, others will begin to see them in a new light. So, thinking about what happened when Jesus prayed and what happened when the disciples prayed, we can ask, what happens when we pray? And I suppose that one of our first impulses would be to say nothing as dramatic as any of this. But we might want to stop and take a step back and consider the possibility that some of those things can happen. Uh, I know for myself that sometimes when I pray, I fall asleep. <laughs> I, have, I feel communion with those disciples. Uh, but those disciples, too, uh, I think, experience a kind of communion. Uh, we experience a kind of communion with God when we pray. Uh, and even when we think it is we who have chosen to pray, our prayer is always, first and foremost, a response to the God who has summoned us to pray. Uh, and a lot of times what happens when we pray, we not, might not be fully aware of or we might not understand. In fact, we might wonder if anything is happening at all. But the writers in our spiritual tradition tell us that we cannot judge the quality of our prayer and the fruitfulness of our prayer by what happens in the moment, but rather over time. How are our lives changed? What kind of fruit do our lives bear in the service of the mission? So I think it's possible that if we open our hearts and minds to God authentically with a sincere longing to be in union with God, then we can discover something of our own identity and mission. We can interpret it in terms of these exoduses. We can uh, recommit ourselves and claim the identity and mission that Jesus has in mind for us. Think about the ways that we pray. We pray in communion with those who've come before us. When we pray liturgically, uh, we pray in a tradition of the sacraments and the liturgy that has been handed on to us by generations, in images and symbols that have been handed on to us over generations. We interpret our own identity and mission in terms of these images and symbols. When we pray with scripture, we do much the same thing with the stories that are there. And I was even thinking about the rosary. 
that as we pray the rosary and meditate upon the mysteries of the rosary, what we are doing is placing ourselves in communion with those who are part of those mysteries, and we're coming to understand ourselves and our mission in terms of what we meditate upon. We do the same thing with the Psalms. And even when we are entering into a prayer of contemplation, which has itself been handed on to us by those who have preceded us in our tradition, we are finding in communion uh, with those who have come before us a sense of who we are and what we're called to. So we begin to see ourselves in a new light, and others begin to see us in a new light. That light is not our own, it's the light of Christ, it's fueled by the Spirit. It is something that we might find challenging and scary as well as affirming because uh, the new light in which we see ourselves might actually show us that we need to make some changes in our lives, but changes that offer, offer hope and encouragement. If this is what can happen when we pray, I would like to offer uh, an example, relatively contemporary and an example that has to do with the whole church, namely the Second Vatican Council. What happened at the Second Vatican Council? Well, there had been a movement, uh, a stirring of the spirit that began in the middle to the latter part of the middle of the 20th century. And uh, there was a summons to prayer. There was a summons to something different. That summons was given articulation by Pope John the 23rd to call a Second Vatican Council. The Council itself took three years, from 1963 to 1965, but it was preceded by a few years of preparation and many years of implementation. But what's significant in all of this is that the entire experience of the Council was rooted in prayer. Every session of the Council began with prayer, and the Council itself was caught up in the framework of the liturgical year over those three years, of the Eucharist that was celebrated, of the Liturgy of the Hours that was prayed, of the bishops and the participants' own personal prayer. And something happened, something happened in the prayer that took place in the Council, something that was surprising, something that offered opportunity, uh, and something that today still remains uh, a challenge and an opportunity. The church began to see itself in a new light. So we have, for example, a document that is issued called the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church. And in this document, the most important image of the church that is offered is that the church is the people of God. The people of God. And this is different than the churches, the bishops, the priests, etc. But the whole people of God is the primary image of the church. And the very document itself is called Lumen Gentium, Light of the Nations. The, church, the bishops of the Second Vatican Council, in their prayer, saw themselves and the church in a new light. And then there was another document that was promulgated called the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. And in this document, uh, in the very first paragraph, the bishops say that we are called to walk with people and to meet them in terms of their hopes and dreams for the concrete world in which they live. This was a kind of different way of looking at the church. It was seeing the church and themselves in a new light. And in the liturgy constitution that was promulgated, the bishop said, you know, the liturgy is not just something that's done by the priest, but rather Christ is present in the word. Christ is present in the assembly and in the Eucharistic species. They saw the liturgy itself in a new light. And in each of the 16 documents of the Council, we can find the same thing happening. What happens when the bishops prayed is that they saw themselves and the church, their identity and mission in a new light. So there's a lot to think about in this familiar reading that we call the Transfiguration when we use it or enter it from the point of view of asking what happens when we pray. I think the most important thing to remember in all of this is that if we pray with openness, with faith, with trust in the power of the Spirit, that something, we might not recognize it at the time, but something good will happen when we pray, 
and we will get a fuller and more uh, in-depth understanding of who we are and what we're called to be. So, please pray. And I thought, what could be more appropriate to wrap up this reflection than to pray the prayer that the bishops of the Second Vatican Council prayed at the beginning of every session of the Council. We've done this prayer before, but I think it's worth praying it again. So let us pray. We stand before you, Holy Spirit, conscious of our sinfulness, but aware that we gather in your name. Come to us, remain with us, enlighten our hearts. Give us light and strength to know your will, to make it our own, and to live it in our lives. Guide us by your wisdom. Support us by your power. For you are God, sharing the glory of Father and Son. You desire justice for all. Enable us to uphold the rights of others. Do not allow us to be misled by ignorance, or corrupted by fear or favor. Unite us to yourself in the bond of love, and keep us faithful to all that is true. As we gather in your name, may we temper justice with love, so that all our decisions may be pleasing to you, and earn the reward promised to good and faithful servants. You live and reign with the Father and the Son, God forever and ever. Amen. Oh